Okay, now I think we are recording. Welcome everyone to the second speaker check-in for DrupalCon Portland. Um, I am going to once again flip over to screen share. You should be able to, if you're in the uh, WebEx webinar right now, you should be able to go ahead and download the slides if you want to skip ahead. And I am going to switch over to PDF Presenter, there we go. And Okay, um, if you've got questions as we go along, either use the WebEx chat window or the IRC uh, channel pound DrupalCon. Uh, if you're having any problems, you can also ping me in um, either in IRC or in uh, Twitter. I've got both of those open and I'm sort of half watching them. So if I drift off from time to time, it's that I've disappeared to um, do a little bit of a technical check-in with someone else. Today's presentation should be less than 45 minutes. I'm happy to stay as long as needed to answer any of your questions. What we're going to be going through today is the um, slides session format in terms of some of the different ways that you can present your information and also your last due date for the speaker check-ins with your track chair. The date, some of you um, got a bit confused about the April 19th date. That was indeed your uh, date to check in with your track chair and make sure that a, an overview or the draft slide deck was available to be reviewed. This is not us checking to make sure that you've done your homework. This is us checking to make sure that there's nothing that we can help you with or just, you know, a couple of deadlines to uh, remind you that some preparation is appreciated and required. Your next deadline is May 10th, and on this date, we, I'll switch to green here in case we've got any red, green, colorblind folks and the black isn't showing up with the red. Uh, the May 10th deadline is for your final slide deck. Now, we say final, but that's kind of in air quotes because Ultimately, you will be presenting with your own computer and you can make last minute changes if you need to. So May 10th, we think that's a good time frame for you to have your final slide deck in place. However, you can make last minute changes. And certainly I am I'm always guilty of a few last minute changes myself on my own presentations. So let's get started on uh, the walkthrough today. And ultimately, what I'm going to be taking you through is once you've got your outline in place and maybe your draft slides, what are some of the things that you should be thinking about to evaluate your deck and your presentation from this point forward? And hopefully you do have a rough structure in place at this point. Excuse me. So um, this is kind of the before you begin part, and it's always, it's always a little bit overwhelming to think about what it is that you're trying to get across with your slides and your presentation and all of this stuff. And I think the most important thing that I always come back to and I always encourage people to come back to is your story. The story is the most important thing that you can help the audience with at your DrupalCon presentation. It's not Sorry, I'm just, someone's jumped in here. I'm just going to make sure that everyone is muted. Uh, where's the button for that? There we go. Can you just let me know in IRC if you can still hear me because I've just muted everyone. Just let me know in IRC if you can still hear me. Excellent. Okay, great. So the story is the most important thing that you need to get across during your DrupalCon presentation. It's not the tiny technical details that um, are maybe the most important thing to you, but it's not necessarily the most important thing for someone to remember about your presentation. They simply need to remember that you had important details that they should go back and look up. So really what we want people to be doing is answering the question, so what? Why should I care about this presentation? 
what was it about the story that I need to come back to later on? How is it going to impact my future self? Ultimately, um, you should know the desired outcome for your audience as well. And that means that at the end of the presentation, they're going to have a specific takeaway or a specific action that you want them to take. And then the week after DrupalCon, when they're at work, they're going to be able to, to put into action your story. So keeping a focus on that one thing that you want people to do or that one desired outcome is really going to help focus your slides and eliminate a lot of the stuff that, quite frankly, people aren't going to remember anyways. It's going to make the, the presentation more confusing and we want to simplify, we want to refine, and we want to make this into, as I referred to in the first speaker check-in, an edutainment experience. We want to engage and excite people, but we don't expect them to actually walk out of the room with new capacity or a new skill set. This is not, it's not the same as a training session where we expect some learner outcomes on this. So let's take a moment and go through three different things that I think are key to um, whether you're a new presenter or a really experienced presenter, there's really three things that I think are very powerful. And the first one to remember is that you are an awesome person. You as a presenter are up there, you've been selected, you are there to rock it, and um, you know, people are there to see you. So number one, it's you on stage. Number two is that your slides are going to give you some polish, they're going to enhance your delivery, but they're not the story. You're the story, you're the storyteller. Your slides are, you know, if you think about maybe your parents read to you as a kid or maybe your siblings read to you, it, the, the book was important for sure, but it was that act of being with someone else that really was special, not necessarily just the book on its own. Ultimately, the third thing, people who remember you will remember your lessons and they'll they'll fall in love with you. They won't fall in love with your slides. So even if you're not super comfortable in the visual domain, that's fine. Let's look at a different way to present the same information that I've just given you. R with this one, we started out with just a number three on the screen. Now let's take a look at that exact same information, but with a different presentation. So this time I'm going to tell you that I've got three things. You have a wonderful story to tell, your slides enhance your delivery, and people want to fall in love with the story that you're about to tell them. People don't want to be bored. They don't want you to fail on stage. They want to have an awesome experience, and whether you know it or not, they are secretly rooting for you and cheering for you. You just need to remember that. Now let's look at a third way to present that same information. You are wonderful, your slides give you polish, and people remember you and remember your lesson, but not necessarily your slides. In IRC, what I'd like you to do now is tell me what I just said. And also in the comments, so, so in IRC as you're typing out, which of the three slides resonated with you the most? What did you feel that you were able to focus on as a listener? So I'll just pause for a second here and, and have the, uh, the IRC take over for a second. Um, I'll read some, people fall in love with you, it's not the slides, this is great. And what were some of the visual, what were the visuals that, that stuck with you, you personally? Because we tend to prepare slide decks that resonate with us, which is great because when you're on stage, you also want it to feel familiar and comfortable for you. Did you like the number presentation better, where I just had the number three? Or did you like it when there was words to follow along with? <laughs> and see, so this is great. So people are, and it, they're not disagreeing in IRC, but people are saying that different things resonate with them, and this is, this is part of what I love about presenting. We're all different. So every time we as a speaker get up on stage, 
our slides say something about us as a presenter, as a storyteller, and um, we need to think about our biases when we're preparing these stories because the audience may not have the same um, affection for the way that we've chosen to deliver the information. So let's go through a couple of really text heavy slides here and um, take a look. I'm just going to sort of read through them with you. Webinar delivery is very difficult because you can't see my charming self on stage. Um, so let's read through a couple of different uh, text heavy slides before we get to some of the pictures. All right, so the first one here is when teachers care, students engage. Um, this slide is using a, an assertion based title Commonly what we do is we put questions at the top and then we put bullets at the bottom that answer those questions. I've been trying to get away from that and moving more towards assertion based statements or assertion based slides that have the summary or the answer on top. Because if people are reading email or they're looking away, that's what they're going to, to look up to quickly is the headline. So I want to give all of my information in the headline instead of the question in the headline. Now let's take a look at what these points are and what that actually means that when teachers care, students engage. So to engage the audience, you need to care about your topic. And I think that this is the, the biggest takeaway that I can give you, that I can share with you, is you having a passion for what you're sharing with people is, that's going to be infectious. So I want you, when you're on stage, in your story, in your presentation, to reveal your curiosity and your passion. I want you to tell a story to people, and this can be about failure or it can be success. But telling a story will really pull people in and give them a reason to connect with your information. One of the things that I like doing is to make connections to other sessions. If you're the first um, presentation in your in your session or in your track or in your day, you can still connect to the keynote. And if there's no connections, obviously just skip this. But it is kind of a nice thing to be able to do and say, remember in this session when that presenter was talking about blah, well, my foo is similar to their blah. Make those connections for people. Highlight important things. So really spend some time to punch up the stuff that that you think is important. And if we, we think about how graphic that number three was, the number three didn't matter at all, but it sure gave a highlight to something specific because it was so different from the previous four slides and then the subsequent two slides. This is um, a Drupalcon specific rule. We ask that you don't sell or pitch commercial products. And that's because, well, for a lot of different reasons, but ultimately it's really hard to get excited about a sales pitch. Um, my apologies to any salespeople who are on this speaker check-in or watching later. I'm sure yours are much better than most of the ones that I've seen and I look forward to seeing your pitch, just not on DrupalCon stage. <laughs> um, and finally, uh, on this point in terms of when teachers care, students engage, let your slide, slide deck support your story. Your slides aren't the, the full story. You are the story and your experiences are the story your slide should be supporting that story. Your slides should enhance your story. So I'm just scanning back to see if there was anything else. Nope, we're good in IRC, good. So your slide should enhance your story. And one of the things that's difficult is we can work either in an oral domain or and uh, oh gosh, now I can't think of which oral I was. I was doing O R A L or A U R O. Uh, in any case, we can do one thing and only one thing. We can experience in one sense or another, but it's very difficult to experience in two senses. At this point in time, type into IRC. Were you reading or listening? <laughs> Excellent. So we've got some listeners and we've got some readers. So you can see here that the majority of people were listening to my words and they weren't reading what was on the slide, but one person was reading. So people can generally do one or the other, but both is very difficult. So if you have a lot of words on your slide, caution. 
while your audience is reading, they are not listening to you. You can go back and forth, but generally speaking, unless you are reading the words on the slide, it's very difficult for people to sync up that information. I personally think that there are three situations where it's appropriate to use text-heavy slides. The first is if you're reinforcing new vocabulary. So if you've got specific commands or specific um, code and you want people to learn the words, I think in those situations, text-heavy does make sense. If you are limited by your visual connection, uh, I tend to, when I'm presenting in webinar, use word-heavy slides, although when I'm presenting on stage with people in front of me, like actually sat in front of me, I tend to use picture-heavy slides. And the third situation is when you're presenting to an audience whose primary language is not your primary language. And I think for me, um, this is more true at DrupalCon Europe. I tend to speak very, very quickly when I get excited about something. And so having more words on the slide means that if someone can't keep up with my accent and my Canadianisms, they can just tune me out and they can read my slides instead. They'll still pick up my enthusiasm, but they don't necessarily need to hear every single word and understand every single word in my presentation. This is less of a concern at DrupalCon North America, but still something to consider. Um, one of the things that, that I've tried really hard to do is at the beginning of my presentation, I reset my enthusiasm clock. And my enthusiasm clock dictates how quickly I'm allowed to speak in a given situation. If you go back and watch my Munich presentation, Watch the first sort of minute or two and then fast forward to where I start ranting, which I think is maybe three quarters of the way through. There's a snap where I click into a level of enthusiasm that has a much, much faster pace to it. Um, we can, <laughs> Lorna is saying she speaks slower, slower for a U.S. audience because she's British. Um, but it is something to think about is, is your pacing. You want to show your enthusiasm but not to the detriment of um, your audience being able to understand what you're saying. And certainly text heavy slides can help in those situations. All right, let's take a look at our third text heavy slide here. And this one, I've changed the language on this one to relate more to or to use the language that we use in web accessibility. And here I've said that good slides can be perceived. And for those of you who um, have done some web accessibility work, what are the two different ways that perceived or perception is interpreted? In, in IRC, just go ahead and type it in. I know that there are a few of you who've done at least usability work, if not accessibility work as well. So again, what are the two and the English majors among you, yes, Seth, go ahead. What are the two different definitions of what perceived can mean? Oh, I'm getting crickets on this one. <laughs> Let's see if anyone gets it. No, nope. all right. So, <laughs> no guesses. So the, the, two, the two ways that perception matters, and especially when it comes to slide decks and, and information is, can I see the information and do I understand the information? The, the sort of do I understand bit is what's the point of the slide? Is this a joke that other people are going to understand? Is this, can this be perceived by the audience in the sense of understood? Is it going to relate to your story and enhance your story? How does the imagery, in other words, support your story? How does the slide support the story? Now, the second definition is simply, can you read it? Can you see it? Can someone at the back of the room read this slide? One of the things that I do when I, if I can, if I can get away with it, I go into the room that I'm going to be presenting in the very beginning of the day before the first session, 
and I go back and I talk to the AV tech folk and I say, can I plug in? I just need to make sure that my fonts are big enough. I plug myself in and my vision's pretty good. So I take my glasses off and I walk to the back of the room and I flip through my slides and I check to see, can I actually read my own slides? And if I can't, I do whatever I can to increase the font size, increase the contrast, and make them easier to see the slides. Now, if your slides are as text heavy as this is, you have no room to fiddle around in terms of improving the perception or seeability, if that's a word. Uh, it is now, of course, because I've just said it, <laughs> um, of those slides. So give yourself some wiggle room. So we've talked over here about font size and then also high enough contrast and taking the time to actually check to make sure that, um, that this is possible. So question in IRC is, do we have access to these folks, AV people, and when? What I have always done, so this is a question from Seth, what I have always done is just shown up at the conference, quote unquote, early. Generally speaking, on Monday, they are in the rooms and setting up the AV. Now, go and find your room. Um, I am not sure which rooms we're using for DrupalCon Portland, but I know that there are small rooms and I know that there are big rooms. If you're in a room that holds 100 people or 50 people, you're fine. You don't need to double check it because people will physically be forced closer to the screen. If you're in a room that holds a few hundred people, people like to sit in the back row. Um, that's when you do need to check in with the AV folks. They are probably going to be setting up on the Monday, but they'll also be there, um, generally speaking, as of the keynote each morning. So you should be able to go in and just check with them. You also, at registration, can simply ask, you know, where, who can I go and talk to who's on site that day um, to point you in the right direction. Yeah, you should be able to on Monday uh, drop in and see them. In my experience, the AV people get really excited when you care enough about your presentation to show up ahead of time and check in with them. But you might need to be a bit flexible and just say, hey, I'm hoping to hop on stage and check these slides out. When would be a good time for you? And they will let you know when a good time is for them. They are going to be your superheroes on the day of your presentation. So um, not that you should bring them chocolate or something like that, but you know, in that level. <laughs> Okay, so my sort of pro tip on this one is assume that everything is going to go wrong with your slides. They won't be perceived. You can't, you can't actually get it working. Just upload them and then tell people to download the slide deck. That's the easiest cheat in that one. All right, so enough with the tech heavy stuff. Let's take a look at some way to incorporate imagery. One of the things that we need to be aware of when we incorporate imagery is that it's, it's not always something that can be perceived or understood by the audience for a variety of different reasons. Um, in IRC, how many people um, either grew up on Mr. Rogers or are familiar with Mr. Rogers? See, I, I had Mr. Dress Up, but I did know about Mr. Rogers as well. So just sort of, you know, have you seen this character before? Yeah, um, just to go back in time, if you if you do have a handout for people, by all means, let them know that it's available for download. You can put that on your introductory slide as well. Okay, so Mr. Rogers um, had a had a routine that he went through, and one of the things that he would do every day is he would feed the fish. And Mr. Rogers would always tell you when he was feeding the fish. And I found out um, recently, I didn't I didn't know this, um, but he would tell the people he was feeding the fish because he had a blind girl uh, write him a letter and say, Mr. Rogers, I don't know if you're feeding the fish. Can you tell me please when you're actually feeding them because I'm concerned that they're not getting fed. Um, and whether it's true or not, it doesn't really matter because Mr. Rogers from that point on told people he was feeding the fish. And this is something that you need to think about with your slides. Is there someone in the room who for whatever reason can't perceive your slide? Are they missing out? Did they know that your fish are being fed? 
So in, in your presentation, it's just something to think about. Make the, the delivery of your story encompass as many senses as possible. And that includes the, the oral storytelling, the visual storytelling, all of these elements kind of fit together. But for, for crying out loud, just tell them when you're feeding the fish. <laughs> all right, so now here we go. Here's the text equivalent. Not everyone in your audience will be able to see or read your slides. Always describe the content of the slides as best you can without interrupting the flow. And finally, make sure that your jokes are accessible to everyone. And that final point in terms of accessibility, I don't just mean can they see the image and they, can they take part in the joke, but culturally, is this something that's going to be accessible to them? And the cultural bit is it's something that over time I have gone from appealing to who I thought would be the majority of the audience to becoming more conservative and more aware of the future audience who's not sitting in front of me. I am more interested in my presentations today in someone five years from now who's watching the recording, feeling like they were included and part of the joke and part of the story. So I generally cut out a lot of crass humor that personally, like when after the sessions are over and when we're out having a drink, I will tell you all the rude jokes there are to know. But it's not my onstage behavior because I don't feel that it's inclusive and I don't feel, feel that it's accessible to my audience today and my audience that I want five years from now to join the Drupal community. So that's my kind of like soapbox <laughs> story about jokes. I'm happy to um, review if you're not sure if your content is going to be perceived as funny. I'm happy to go over that with you, but ultimately, um, you're all smart folks. I bet you can figure it out. Okay, so the next piece. Um, I will, in, <laughs> in blue, circle this one. Templates are required. Yes, I know that um, Seth did not want to use the templates yesterday. I, I feel kind of bad that I keep calling him out on this, but, um, you know, I got to pick on someone, right? So yes, templates are required, and that's because we use them at the beginning and at the end of your slide decks. The templates are available on the speaker resources page. So probably that's where the page you went to to find out how to click through and sign up for the webinar today. Um, if you go simply to the DrupalCon Portland site, and then under speakers and speaker resources, those downloadable templates are there. You don't need to use them for your whole slide deck. And in fact, if you use them for the middle of your slide deck and use the 18 layers of nested bullet points down to a 0.2 font, I am gonna unfriend you and that's it. Like no friending of people who use 18 layers of nested bullet points down to a 0.2 font. But please, 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 please use the intro and outro templates Add another title page for your own slide, no problem. But what we do is we use these to um, edit the videos. And the more easily perceived the beginning and end of your presentation is, the faster the AV teams can crop your sessions and get your videos uploaded. So again, just the first and the last slide from the template slide deck from DrupalCon. Do beautiful things on the inside of your slide deck but those first and last slides, please do use the templates. My other tip here is for your own templates, please make sure that you're using styles that you can globally change. So don't, don't just manipulate a font size, but manipulate a style. Think of it as applying CSS to your slides, because if your slides, for whatever reason, aren't working and you need to change the font size or the font that's being used, having to edit your slides one by one, hand over hand, is, it's just gonna waste your time and stress you out. So make sure that you are using styles within your slide decks. Um, generally speaking, if you're using a template of some kind, you are using styles and you should be fine. If you need more information about it, ping me afterwards and I will absolutely help you get set up with that. All right. 
I'm going to go through quickly a couple of different text-based formats for slides. Um, I think these are, it's, it's less interesting information and same concepts as what we went over in terms of the number three, but just to give you some, some more visual to reinforce that you don't need to use our template in terms of the DrupalCon template, but there's different, different formats have different advantages to them. So I've, I've got three different samples. One is to include all the words. The second is just a few words. And then the third one is just a few words in context. So in IRC, go ahead and as we flip through these examples, shout out in IRC, is this an example that you like? Is it one that you don't like? What do you like about it? What don't you like about it? So here's the first one. This is all the words. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a wall of text, isn't it? Exactly. So let's take a look at what the content is on this one. This is telling me to put important information in the center, and then this is essentially a speaker note, right? The important stuff will get clipped off. Do use the largest font possible. The room you're presenting in is bigger than you think. And that doesn't mean it's full. It just means that there's someone who's sitting in the back row because that's what they like to do. And let's face it, folks who like to sit in the back row are probably in this webinar as well. You know who you are. <laughs> do pro provide focus within the slide itself. Laser pointers and shadow puppets won't work with big conference projectors. One of my favorite things to do is to sit in front of the projector and like actually get my hands up in there and point at code and like do little shadowy puppet things. Now that we're using big girl projectors that do rear screen, like they, they present from behind instead of in front, this doesn't work and it saddens me deeply, but it means that I've had to put the focus within the slide itself. Do embed videos instead of using live demos. No one watch, wants to watch you fail. Everyone wants to see you succeed. Do use images to support your message or not, whatever works really. Do ensure everyone can participate. Um, my safest assumption for this is assume that Everett is going to be sitting in your presentation and Everett can be everywhere all of the time and Everett will let you know if he cannot perceive the content. Okay, same slide, different way of absorbing the information. This time I'm going to give you only one of those bullet points at a time. Put information in the center. Now I as the speaker have to remember that the subtext is the important stuff will get clipped off. And the next one down, use the largest font possible. The room you're presenting in is bigger than you think, so you wanna make sure that font is big. A couple of suggestions in IRC is to use a minimum of 18 point for the font size. The other thing to be aware of is you want to turn off auto resizing on your slides because that'll squish the font down. So you think it's 18 point, but actually it's just bumped down to 12 point because you filled up the slide. The third one here, provide focus within the slide laser pointers and shadow puppets won't work with big conference projectors. So make sure that the focus can exist within the slide itself. And one more way of presenting that same, oh, focus could be, um, well, I've got a couple of examples later on, but more to do with code. So let me, let me skip through these other examples and show you the code stuff specifically in a couple of slides. Okay, so same three bullet points that we're going to take a look at, and this time I'm going to highlight one at a time. So once again, there's no speaker notes on the slide. Put information in the center, the important stuff will get clipped off, and then I go to the next slide, use the largest possible font, the room's bigger than you think, minimum 18 point font, and the third point, provide focus within the slide, um, don't rely on external things to be able to point out font, okay? So that's three different ways of presenting exactly the same information. And choose one that, that you like or choose none of them. It doesn't, doesn't really matter as long as you're consistent and you're enhancing your story. All right, so now we move on to more images and some more examples. Um, I tend to present with more pictures and and tell a story that goes along with my pictures in part because I 
my early career as a public speaker involved memorizing four minute speeches and then spitting back exactly the same words. I'm lousy at it. I'm really, really lousy at staying on script. I'm really great though at telling a story. So I personally am a lot more comfortable putting up an image that triggers me into telling the supporting story. All right, now let's take a look at, I think there's about half a dozen of these examples. So, um, number one, what language is this? Let's see if there's anyone who can pick this one out. Spanish, thank you. And um, if, if you don't speak Spanish, which I don't, do you recognize what this might be about? Are there any things, are there any visual cues in here? Clout, yeah. So even if you don't speak the language, it's not your, your natural language, it's not even a language that you speak, forget about it being your first or, or more common language, there's still some cues in here that you can relate to and a couple of words that you can mix and match with. Beautiful, beautiful slide deck. Um, this is, if you've downloaded the PDF yourself of the slide, this is on speaker deck and it's a uh, um, the URL is up in the top. There it is there. But it's big, it's bold, it's got some focus with some examples, and it also has quadrants in terms of saying in the bottom right, in the bottom left, you've got areas that you can provide focus with through language even if you don't have access to a pointer. The next one here is um, perhaps some of you have seen this slide before. Does anyone know if I, okay, without looking at who it is, does anyone know whose slide this is? Have you seen this presentation before? Yeah, it's an Eaton slide. <laughs> yeah. So this one here is great in terms of telling a story to go along with a graphic. There's no code in here. We don't need to say to people on the left side is an iPhone, on the right side is a camera, phone, elastic band, but you can certainly, you can describe the image as part of the, the narrative or part of the story. This one, now we're going to get into a series of code ones. I think there's three or four code examples. Again, these are all from Speaker Deck, so the URL is, oops, there we go, the URLs are up at the top here. I do like putting URLs in because there's not a great asset management system for slides. Um, so I, it's as much for myself as anything else. Okay, in this one, I've got color and I've got columns. So I can help people out by telling them that there are uh, locations they need to look at. I do like the variable information up at the top. I, you know, I'm less excited about this stuff down at the bottom. I think that that gets in the way, but it depends how you want to engage with your audience. If you want them tweeting and you want them asking questions, then by all means, make sure that that tag is included. Next one. Whoa. That's all I got on that one, right? drowning in text on this. And furthermore, like, why are these logos down here? I just switch back to this for a second. What, what is, what, what is all of that? Um, it's just overwhelming. I don't even know where to start on this one. Okay, so limit your text. <laughs> Next one. This is a lot of text, but it does give me some visual cues. So I can refer up here to my bullet points I can give examples in terms of a bit of color coding down here. You need to be careful with the color coding that you're not relying on. Um, don't just refer to the blue text, explain what the blue text is, but it, you know, it's, it's a little bit better. There's some cues down there. Again, I'm not, I don't, what is this stuff down here? Don't, don't, don't do that to yourself. Okay, next. Um, this is great. This has the pointers in place. So we've got lots of cues in here, but it's not, it's not all jammed in. They're subtle. Here's my, the fact that I'm using um, SAS and CSS and the different examples of the input and the output. Okay, again, these are just some ideas to get you going. They're all pulled from Speaker Deck. 
Um, this one uses a, um, a similar colored font to the background. So essentially this kind of blurs itself out and I end up getting really highlighted text when it's got high contrast. So this is taking advantage of contrast to put focus on the information that you want to talk about. All right. If you need more help on putting your slide decks together, there are uh, three books that I like. All of my inspiration was pulled from speakerdeck.com. Awesome resource. Go, go fill your boots and flip through slide decks there. The three print books that I quite like are Presentations and Slideology, and if you can find it, The Cognitive Style of PowerPoint. Does anyone have any other favorites for slide design? Just an IRC. Do you have any other favorites for slide design? SlideShare for inspiration, yep. Presentation patterns. I got to admit, I did not love presentation patterns, but I will definitely write it down here. Whoops. If I can erg type. Please. There we go. Yep. Uh, Zen. Presentation Zen. Yep. Yep. So presentation patterns. Um, is a, a recently released book that gives basically like coding patterns except for slide decks. I, I, I had very high hopes for it. It's not really the book's fault. It's more I should have not have had the expectations that I did. Okay, so it looks like those are some of the more popular ones. Now let's let's kind of get a little crazy and say, what if you're not going to do a slide deck? Not every presentation has to have a slide deck. There are, I would say, three different styles that inherently don't have a slide deck. Uh, the first is a panel discussion. And uh, this perhaps gives you an indication of what I think of panel discussions. How much fun does that look like to sit through? And yes, I have blurred out the conference. I love them dearly, but um, I've tried to anonymize them. <laughs> it's not fun. Everyone gets 30 seconds and um, it, it's not fun for the audience. So yeah, panels can be really, really good if they are set up like debates and the presenters prepare to argue um, and they come prepared. The moderator, is a very, very critical role in a panel discussion. And this is very different from a group presentation. So this is just, you know, people show up and answer questions kind of ish. You can do it. I, uh, they're not a lot of fun for the audience though. The next one is a fireside chat. This format is what Dries used for his DrupalCon Munich keynote presentation. And I think this can work really well, especially for, and not saying that this is why Dries used it, but this is great for folks who have massive stage fright. So you can have, now I don't know who it was in this one, but let's assume this guy is the asker and these guys are the answerers. Um, you can set up a really nice friendly dynamic where the person who is presenting or the expert, take a look, he's not looking at the audience at all. So he can be totally focused on the other person on the stage with him. And I do think this is totally appropriate and makes sense, especially in situations where the subject matter expert is not, they are totally overwhelmed by public speaking and it just makes them want to blow into a paper bag. I think it's a great format for, for those folks. The third one is the live demo. And we all want live demos to go as well as a Steve Jobs live demo. But the reality is, as speakers, we do not have as much control over our presentation environment as what Steve Jobs and, quite frankly, the amount of time that he was able to commit to his live demos. When mere mortals like us do live demos, 
and they end up going like this. And remember, maybe you do, maybe you don't. This is a live demo where he couldn't get online because there was too many people in the audience using up his bandwidth. He was not a happy camper. This is the unhappy face of Steve Jobs. So what you want to do is control your environment as much as possible if you are giving a live demo. And to me, that means screencast your live demo ahead of time so that you can hit play and show people a live demo, but it's pre-recorded. So it's still live, it's just not live to air, it's live to tape. Um, you need to make your own decisions. I would highly, highly recommend that you not put yourself in Steve, Steve Jobs' shoes and attempt live demos. When they fail, they are disrespectful to the audience and it becomes more and more difficult for the audience to love you if they feel that their time is being wasted. Okay, so in our presentations, we went through a couple, a couple of different examples in terms of slide decks and that kind of stuff, but ultimately, what's your story? What's your style? And what's your point? What do you want people to remember? How do you want to deliver it so that it is memorable for them and fun and engaging for you? And really, what's the story or the experience that you want people to walk away with? Ensure your presentation has a message. I like it when stories have a take home that the audience can share with other people. Ensure every slide supports your message. Ensure every slide can be perceived by the audience. Use any format you like. We looked at a bunch of different formats today but be consistent throughout your presentation. Please do use the intro and intro slides for video editing purposes. And, you know, most of all, I want you to have fun during this presentation that you're going to be giving at DrupalCon. Your remaining due dates are uh, May 10th. You should have a final slide deck in place. Yes, you will be presenting from your own computer, so you can make any last minute changes that you want. You can, um, Upload your slides early if you like, and then continue uploading your slides as you make changes. Let people know that the slides are there for them to download ahead of time, or if for some reason mystery and mystique is really important to your presentation, you can wait until afterwards to do that final upload. Um, I, I'm happy to take questions. I did want to keep this to under 45 minutes. I've gone over by a little bit but I will stick around for as long as people would like. Um, and I, I do see I've already got some, some questions in here. So let me just go back into IRC and answer some of these questions. Uh, question, do you record your narrative on the recorded demo or do you speak live over the playing video? This is kind of, um, it's kind of risky to expect the microphone to correctly tap into your computer. So I would say that it's fine to simply record the demo and then speak live over top of it. But the advantage of recording the audio as well is that you can simply upload that demo for people to review afterwards. Um, that's why we have to be consistent because otherwise people will talk to you about capital letters after your talk. <laughs> I, yeah, I'm pretty inconsistent. Did I have inconsistent capital letters in mind? Probably. Slides ahead of time, pros and cons, Seth is asking. Uh, yeah, I think there's as many pros as there are cons. I, um, I kind of like doing handouts now instead of just uploading my slide deck, which people really hate. They want the slides, even though if like if there's 75% pictures, what are you going to do with that? You want the like you want the handout, which is essentially an export of the speaker notes um, and essentially my script. So I would much rather give people a useful handout, but people still clamor for the slides. I don't know, whatever. But yeah, um, yes, uploading slides ahead of time as an insurance policy. So I upload them. I put them in Dropbox. I have them on a USB keychain and I have them inside your computer, inside my own computer. So I put them all over the place. Often I'll even share them with other people and ask them for feedback and review, which means that there's now a copy of my slides somewhere else. 
if I email them to myself, I can also access them from anywhere that I can get my email. So I am the queen of the backup of the slides. <laughs> um, yes, cover all the bases. Um, so do you prepare printed speaker's note in addition to the slides? I don't print out the speaker notes for myself. Certainly, I do sometimes print out or write out cue cards for myself. One of the things I ran into, I definitely don't print to give out the handouts because you never know how many people will be showing up. So I always do that digitally. But for speaker's note for myself, um, one big caution, I was on the big stage in Munich just because that was the room I was assigned to. And the monitor at the bottom of the stage did not include my speaker notes. It only included what was displaying behind me which meant that if I wanted to see my speaker notes, I had to walk back over to where my laptop was to read what the speaker notes were on the slide. If you are a pacer like I am, you'll be walking away from your laptop and then back to it. It's, it was um, unexpected to not have access to my speaker notes inside my computer. So for you, if that means printing it out, by all means, have a printout as well um, or just be aware that you may not have access to those speaker notes. So this is where practicing is going to help. And if you know you're going to need them, definitely print out the notes as well. That's a great idea. Um, dun, 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 dun. Great, great tip um, to set up a separate user account on your laptop for the presentation. That way you won't have Skype, IM, notifications, et cetera, interrupting your presentation. That's a great tip. Uh, question, do you think where, do you think the thing where people think they want slides is actually they want handouts and will that change? I think, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why people want the slide deck. I think they want to relive in their mind the experience of the presentation, but I, I, I don't know. And it, it could also, like, to be completely fair, it could also be to do with learning styles and people um, will trigger the story better with a visual cue rather than just straight text. So the, um, yeah, yeah. One of the things that I did for the Munich handout was I included the relevant pictures. And I, you know, I spent a fair amount of time on my 14 page handout and no one gave me compliments on it. So I thought it was important. I thought it was a really useful document, but I did not get overwhelmed with compliments on it. So you can decide if you want to spend time on it. I personally think as an educator, it is time well spent for my future learners. But like I said, people did not overwhelm me with compliments on it. Other questions? Uh, webinar is a black background with white text. Is that because, you know, we're watching on our computer for projecting on a big screen is dark text on white background better? It really depends on the quality of the room. If you get a well-lit room that you can't dim, darker is going to be better than lighter, and ultimately having control over your templates is best because you can always swap them out if it's not high contrast enough. And <laughs> not, that, not that high contrast is inherently less beautiful, but I personally prefer, like I like looking at things that are more subtle. And it's really hard to be subtle if you want people to be able to read your slides in a well-lit room that is not optimized for slide projection. So just be prepared to play with things on um, the day of the presentation, you know, save as, swap out the background to see if it helps. And um, people will let you know if they can't read it and tell them to download the slide deck and follow along with the slide deck. Just, just be ready for, for everything going wrong and everything will go perfectly. At least that's been my experience. Over prepare and, and nothing wrong happens. So my final thought for you today is that, uh, oh, sorry, more questions, yes. Uh, if your deck is in HTML, yep, just a URL is fine. No problems there. 
Again, make sure you do, in that case, a screen capture of the template, just something for at the beginning and something at the end so that the video editors can see where the beginnings and ends are because they're, they're looking for that flash of the template. And you can just do a screenshot of that. That's no problem to put that picture in. My, my final quote today, and um, do feel free to drop off if you are heading out. If you've got more questions, that's fine too. But my, my quote for you to remember is that one repays a teacher badly if one always remains nothing but a pupil. So I would love for your presentations at DrupalCon to be like a million times better than mine and for you to just rock out and do an awesome job. And I think you can. I think, I think that everyone has a really interesting and exciting story to tell. And the way that you deliver it does not need to be the same way as mine. It needs to be unique to you and you are going to rock it out. And I look forward to getting some new presentation tips from you after, um, after I've seen you present, which I'm totally stoked about. So thanks everyone. I'm going to end the recording, but I will stick around in IRC if you've got more questions. And uh, if you do need to ping me, if you want support, if you want help, whatever it happens to be, just let me pull up that first slide again. Here are the ways to get in touch with me. On IRC, I'm Emma Jane by email emma at emmajane.net or on Twitter, I'm Emma Jane HW. Thanks everyone.